Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope and trust that you are all well. Before I get started, I would like to give a very special shout out to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Through scrutiny, Samantha Place, Lisa Ratford, Tina Mead, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Mana Ash, Normie DW, Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes, that information can be found below. Also, thank each and every one of you that donated to my GoFundMe, as I am still looking for a place to move and get out of this condemned home. I am still accepting donations. If you would like the link to my GoFundMe, that's also located below in the description. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Side note, except for the first story, the rest of these are very long, so kick back and enjoy. Let's get started, shall we? I went to summer camp in a rural part of New Jersey back in the mid-1990s. The camp was situated on a long, narrow, man-made lake. One end of the lake was reserved for swimming, which we do as a group activity every other day or so. The swimming area had one long dock stretching straight out into the water and two square floating docks further out. One of the two floating docks was a bit far away, and although I had spent a few summers at this camp at the time of this incident, I had never seen anyone use the second dock. One day, our group of about a dozen 11-year-old girls got the bright idea that we were going to swim out to the faraway dock. I would consider this to be a moderate challenge for a casual swimmer. When we reached the dock, I noticed a strange-looking spider on the ladder that you had to use to climb up. It was quite large in terms of overall footprint, probably about two inches, from end to end, with long, skinny legs. Spiders, of course, are normal critters to the entire nature world, but this one stood out to me because of its unusual appearance. After the long swim, we took a few minutes to lie on the dock and rest in the sun. It was relaxing and we were all having a good time. We started messing around and decided to play one of our regular games where we would all shuffle towards the corner of the dock, causing it to sink. As the corner of the dock started to sink and fill with water, suddenly hundreds of giant spiders came frantically pouring out from beneath the boards swarming over and around the feet of those of us who were still standing on dry ground. The dock was theirs, apparently. We all immediately began to scream and jump into the water, trying to get away, but the spiders were in the water too, and stuck to us as we swam. I vividly remember the feeling of them clinging to my wet hair, fleshy bodies and long, squirmy legs, hopelessly intertwined with my own strands. Adrenaline propelled us back to the main part of the swimming area, and by the time we got there, thankfully we were spider-free. But this is a childhood trauma that lingers with me. I had not really been afraid of spiders before, but I would say this was a major turning point. The thought of us lying on the dock in the sun and completely oblivious to the horde that was lurking just inches beneath us still gives me the creeps to this day. Hey there, Backwood Creepy fans. I'm a longtime fan myself. I had a friend call me on Friday who knows I am into this kind of thing. They were in shock at what they'd seen and wondered if I had any idea what this could be. I figured I would share it with you to see if anyone has any ideas. Here is what they shared with me. I was camping at Heart Mountain Hot Springs. At 6.45 a.m., I was leaving my campsite by foot to use the nearest bathroom. 
The campsite sits above the field overlooking the road that runs west to other campsites, a field, creek, and the three hot spring pools. As I was walking out of my sight, I looked across the field and saw an animal. It was at least 200 feet away. I thought it was a wild horse, but there are no wild horses in the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. This animal's body was facing me, south with its head turned slightly to its left. I thought it was a horse because it had a black mane of hair, and its body was brown and shiny. It appeared to be about the size of a yearling at first. I say at first because later I saw a human man in the same location. There's a path there from the west campsites that travels to the parking lot by the east campsites. And I now believe the creature was seven feet to eight feet tall. It turned its right It turned its head right directly toward me. Then it turned its body leftward, east, and walked across the parking lot towards the bridge across the creek, and I lost sight of it in the trees. It was bipedal. It did not move quickly, walking with its back slightly forward, and arms swinging at its sides. I later looked for footprints. The ground was too hardened to find any. I crossed the bridge and walked a little up the creek, north, looking for any evidence like hair and could not locate anything. So, I don't know. What do you think? My only thoughts are either a person dressed in some kind of ceremonial gear or animal skins, although the height makes that unlikely, or an animal with chronic wasting disease which also seems unlikely, given that it was by battle. This is 100% truth, and I'd take any lie detector test that was sent my way. There is more than that. We lived in a house that had an outhouse, no indoor toilet, we had running water, but just couldn't get a proper septic system in there. The outhouse was up the hill a ways, above 30 yards. This was in a valley. Nearest neighbor was roughly four miles away. Good luck if you need an emergency service. We had three dogs. Biggest of all was a lab mixed named Boo Bear. I'm going to split this up so it's not a wall of text. Boo followed mom up there and this time he was between mom and the woods. There was a solid tree line around the house that you couldn't see into at all. I've hunted it, but I'd get my ass back to the house before it even got close to dark. Boo felt or heard something. The more my mom tried to get up, the more he was growling. He had never behaved this way. My mom a devout Baptist, swears on the Bible that she heard what sounded like grunting coming out of the woods. She could feel something, either stomping or punching the ground. Imagine punching a bag of flour. It's got that thud. That's what she described it as. My mom was raised by some serious hillbillies and isn't scared of anything in the woods, so she forced her way up there. She thought it was a deer, as they'll do that in rut season. Boo sat out there growling, and she said every hair he had on him was standing up straight. He wasn't barking. She could feel his growling. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Like you feel bass from a subwoofer. She got done and came back to the house. No other issues that night. A few nights later, a friend was staying at my house. He was one of the ones that was with me when we saw whatever it was that we saw. This was actually prior to this by a year or two. He grew up poor like us, but he was a good dude. His mom and dad were great. Anyhow, it's about 11 or 11.30. It was Friday or Saturday because we had a 10 p.m. bedtime on weeknights and we were playing Killer Instinct on N64. Man... When I say this scared me, I thought my mom was being killed. We heard a scream, 
and felt a noise come from the woods about 150 yards up that mountain. Buddy, I got goosebumps coming up like crazy right now. I didn't say shit. I kept playing, thinking that my brain is playing tricks on me. Five minutes later, it happened again. This time, it was maybe 75 to 100 yards up, and it was heading down. I stopped and asked R.G. if he heard that, and he said, Hell yeah, I heard it the first damn time, too. Man, I can't describe it. Flight or fight kicked in, and we were all in a panic. I checked on my mom and my little brother, and both were fine. I woke up my little bro and told him what was going on, and we grabbed our rifles. I only had a 3006, RG had my 20 gauge, and LB, little bro, had a 22. We parked our asses in the room we were in when we first heard it. When I say my heart was racing, if it was doing the 100 meter dash, it would have beat Usain Bolt. We didn't hear anything for a good 30 minutes. Just nothing. We had the windows open due to no AC, and we had the fans off. We started hearing a noise coming from the woods, just walking. It sounded like something was slowly plodding down the ridge to the house. I know it was no cat. You will never hear a big cat. I've had cougars surprise me, and I've never heard a thing. This was big. It was making a lot of racket. We just kept sitting there, ears on alert. Scream again. This one shook our windows, literally. Everything shook. There was nothing at that point that we could have done. It was within 25 yards or so of our house, and we were all petrified. Boo was just pacing back and forth. He wanted to get out. I didn't want him to go, and neither did LB or RG. He was our safety blanket in that moment. We decided to just hang out in there, and we started hearing the grunting. All I can say is, I've never heard deer in rut. This was way too guttural. This freaky feeling of dread came over all of us. We all started bawling. We legit felt like we were going to die. Mom finally woke up and came in there. She saw us all holding our guns, and she was like, what the hell are you doing? I put my hand up to my face. She seen we were crying, and I put my index finger to my mouth to shh. The grunting kept going, louder and louder. Then, the pounding started. It wasn't hitting a tree or anything. It was hitting the ground, like punching the shit out of it. We could feel each hit. Mom said this was what she had heard the other night, but that she didn't think much of it. Oh, man. This shit seriously scared me. The grunting and pounding stopped. Mom decided to send Boo out. Nikki and Bella, our other dogs, didn't do shit. Boo was just a badass, and we were his family. He beelined it up there. That was it. We heard one yelp and nothing. We didn't hear anything else that night. For several days, it was that way. Boo was gone, and we were all shook up. I think it was five or six days later, my stepdad went to use the outhouse, and laying next to the building was Boo. I swear on my life that this dog was literally torn apart. There were no bite marks. It wasn't a cat. It had literally been ripped apart limb from limb. I don't know what it was. Could have even been a boar. I don't know. I know that we moved out of there a month later, and that damn place can't keep people in it anymore. I can't say that I smelled anything or anything like that. The outhouse smelled pretty damn gnarly. Definitely one of the worst experiences of my life. I'm sorry, listeners. Normally, I don't input my thoughts, but seriously, that mom can go to hell for sending that poor dog out to be torn apart. Now, let's get back to our stories.
The story takes place in North Italy back in 2014. It was early September. A friend of mine proposed to me to make a short hike in the woods near his town, and I've obviously agreed since I love hiking in the nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove to the place. My friend knew very well the area, so we didn't take a map. We didn't have flashlights neither, or else, since we planned to return to the car in a few hours, and in early September, daylight lasts still pretty long. As we went deeper into the woods, we saw beautiful spots, small rivers, and a pair of caves we explored. They were pretty small and had only one big chamber. We had lunch and proceeded to follow a trail into a deeply wooded area. After around half an hour, we were at this point around 50 minutes away from the car since we stopped so many times to take pictures or explore areas. We arrived to a pretty large clearance. And here comes the scary part. In that clearance, there were a bunch of about four to five people normally dressed. They were simply talking and laughing. No satanic cults, dreadful chants, praying in a circle or else. Just super ordinary people like me and my friends talking to each other. They obviously saw us too, since the clearance had no trees or rocks to cover the view. And we couldn't avoid that, since the trail, after a deep curve, immediately ends into the clearance, proceeding to the other side of it, actually. We said, approaching them, since they were in the middle of the track, Hey there, what's up? They didn't answer back and started to stare at us without saying a single word. This obviously launched a huge red flag. We stopped too, and I looked to my mate. He looked back at me concerned. We said again, Hey. No answers. I started feeling uneasy so we decided to return back to the car. But just as soon as we started to move back, we realized that they started to follow us. As we noticed, we yelled, Why are you following us? Did we do something wrong? Yeah, we still were pretty young and dumb. In those kind of situations, it's often run immediately the hell out of there if people act this way. Still, we got no answer. Obviously, we proceeded to walk faster and tried to get out of the trail. Another pretty dumb choice, but again, my friend knew well the area. But they always were at around 15 meters of distance. We started to panic, so we looked again to each other and agreed to get out of there quickly. As soon as we began running, we heard that they started to run too. This obviously made us freak out, and we made our best to put more distance between us and them. Another thing that made me panic was the fact that we were, as said, around 40 minutes away from the car at that point, in a very isolated area. So I thought that we were obviously hopeless. At a certain point, when we were about half the way back, we started to notice that they weren't behind us anymore. We thought that maybe, and luckily... We managed to make them lose our track. The area, as said, is heavily wooded and has plenty of slopes, so that's easy to get lost if you are not used to it. Plus, we took an off-way trail that my friend knew. We hid behind a thick bush and tried to listen. Silence. No footsteps, nor voices. And keep in mind that, even when they were following us, they didn't say a single word. So, we took our breath and managed to return to the car, trying our best to be as silent as possible. We jumped in the car and raced the hell out of there, but it doesn't end here. As we left the woods on the main road, we saw, coming from a secondary road, another car behind us. They were following us again, and they've surely never lost our tracks while we were returning to the car. We are sure that they were the same people since, one, they were basically tailgating us, and two, the area is very rarely visited and there weren't absolutely zero cars except for my friends, one. Oh, and three, their car had no plates. We drove to my friend's town. 
avoiding to go to his house, taking every country road and every turn we made. They did as well. As we reached the town's ingress, they made a U-turn and returned back to the woods direction. We were freaking terrified, and we immediately called the police and informed the people that were in the small town's square as they approached us, since me and my friend were basically crying as we got out of the car, to check that area out, but no evidence of activity came up in the following hours. They never ever showed up in the following days, but we became paranoid for some weeks to even get out of our houses. And this is why I've taken a break from hiking for about four years. I have no idea who they were and why the hell they acted like that. But that experience also gave me PTSD. It has been terrifying. Oh, and fun fact, both of my dreadful experiences, this one and another one, happened in broad daylight. It still chills me to this day. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He had tons of old cowboy stories he would tell us, grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were just downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from nearby farms, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand, and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. Now, mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portneuf River to ice skate. There were eight kids all together, and they were excited to show off their new skates from Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bayer and the Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker, and if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow brush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They fled towards the sleighs, trying to scramble up the river embankment in their skates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because the skates and fell back towards the ice. The giant was now crossing the river towards them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river, because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged its shins, but was slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their relief, it didn't chase the sleighs. It just stood there hollering at the kids and swinging his tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch, where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community, and soon a posse was formed to hunt down this beast. Where the kids had been skating, there was found footprints almost two feet in length. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The posse followed them as far as they could, but 
deep snow prevented their travel any further. The creature was never sighted in that area again. This story captivated the small community, and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho Wild Man. That spring, my great-grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the Little Lost River Valley, farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwood encounters and stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure he would have been killed if the giant hadn't broke through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. This is long and still ongoing, but bear with me. Here's some context. I, a 24-year-old female, live in a basement suite with my fiancé, a 26-year-old female. We live below a man and his young daughter. We're pretty friendly and look out for one another, but aren't exactly close. It's a normal detached home, just divided. We have no windows facing the backyard just to the left and right of the house. Please note that while we live in the same house, we have had no issues other than hearing what is happening upstairs. I am also an extremely deep sleeper. Behind our backyard is a ravine, basically a tiny creek, but it's incredibly steep on either side, covered in bushes, trees, etc. It's not exactly easy to walk around in, we have a short, maybe four foot tall chain link fence dividing our property from the creek. One house down, there is a little path that leads down the creek and connects to an adjacent field and playground. It's maintained. There are no other paths off the main one. It is just prickly bushes and steep, tough terrain. All right, on to the story. About three months ago, my fiancé woke me up terrified because she had heard banging outside and there were flashlights shining into our ground level windows. I instantly called 911 who promptly told me the cops were already there and probably the ones with flashlights. Annoyed, I pulled on some pants and headed outside to see what was happening. I was informed by the police the man above me had called because he stated people were on his property harassing him. They ask if we know of any ongoing mental health issues on his side, which makes me question if anything actually happened. But my fiancé did hear some weird shit before the cops showed up. All the while, I'm watching my neighbor plead with the police to check the creek out back, because he swears he saw them go out that way. They briefly shine their flashlights back there and leave, determining nothing is actually going on. I get the lowdown the next day. Apparently, he heard people banging on his back door, throwing gravel at his windows, and watched his front door handle turn. The man was freaked out, terrified for his daughter, and had no clue who it could be. He spends the next week barely sleeping, sitting by the back door with a baseball bat. Nothing happens, so we all relax. It happens again a week later, as soon as he chills out. Same deal, fiancé wakes me up, less scared because we know what's going on, but nevertheless the cops find nothing and the upstairs man is freaked again. This time he installs cameras. They're on the inside of his house, pointed out of the windows. They're rather small and hard to notice and there's no way you could see them at night. This seems to do the trick. We no longer are dealing with the cops or the banging from whoever is harassing our neighbor. However, after about a month, I get chatting in the yard with the neighbor and he tells me almost every single night someone has been in the creek shining a light into his windows. His bedroom specifically. Laser pointers, flashlights, you name it. It's coming from the creek. I'm a little freaked out, but tell myself he's overly paranoid. Could be some lights from the other side, blah blah blah. This keeps going on. He consistently is complaining about these lights. 
Concerned, someone is still messing with him and with being in the same house. Last week, I said to hell with it and bought the best outdoor camera I could afford. With all the fancy night vision features and all that jazz. Rio Link Duo 2, I think is what I bought. Doesn't hurt to have security cameras anyways, right? It should be arriving soon. In the meantime, I'm thinking of some way to keep someone out of the creek. Still slightly doubtful anyone could get back there without hopping our fence. I walk down the path open to the public use. Stop where the property fences line start. Push past a prickly bush that tries to take me out and come across a well-worn path with footprints and broken branches and flattened bushes that have clearly been walked on repeatedly. Creeped out, I push on to see where this path goes and it ends right at our property. Right where my neighbor says the lights come from. There is nowhere else to go. The path is right next to where it drops off into the creek. I couldn't go further as it's all thick bush. It just ends at our house. Someone, for weeks, had been sitting in the woods behind our house, tormenting my upstairs neighbor for no apparent reason. I am unbelievably creeped out. How do they know what bedroom he's in? How did they know when the cameras went up? Why do they even bother us? He swears up and down he doesn't have any enemies. His ex is the mother of his daughter. They share custody, and she wouldn't scare her like that. I'm as baffled as I am horrified. I would like to get to the bottom of this, so finally I can get some peaceful rest. So, this encounter happened many years ago, and I was very young. It was in 2001 or 2002, and I was about 11 to 12 at the time. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I do not know exactly where, but it was several acres in a very remote area. My father, mother, and myself decided to accompany him one Saturday to scope out the property. From our home, it was a little more than a three-hour drive but we all love riding in the car. So while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip, we went just to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. No houses anywhere near, and hardly even any signs of life at all, apart from a few birds in the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to go explore the woods a little. My uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, not really my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a very nice day, but still something felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder which made me on edge too. She was very insistent that it was weird and she wanted to leave, saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed that there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was nothing about it in the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open and inside there were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to get back to the car. If there was some crazy hermit living in the woods, we didn't want to be around to find out. Only issue? We had walked pretty far into the woods and now weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. The creepy feeling really amped up and we were all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road. But we were further down from where we had parked the car. But at least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, 
we came across a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark gray cat on fire. I had no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere or how it came to be killed and set alight. Obviously, this had just happened, but there was no one in sight. Naturally, we ran the rest of the way to the car. There was a huge scratch in the paint all down the side of it from hood to trunk. Thankfully, that was the only damage and my dad was able to start it without any trouble and we drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is sped up just recounting this moment. Definitely one of the scariest of my life. Needless to say, my uncle did not buy that land, and I'll always remember this terrifying encounter. But, like anything over time, I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind, and it just became one of those odd moments you occasionally retail at a family get-together years later. So much that it's almost just a funny story. The reason I'm sharing this is because I was reminded of it last night while binge-watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube when they shared the story of a family that disappeared in the same area while also looking at some land for sale. The disappearance of the Jameson family is the name of the mystery in the video if you're interested. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are many theories about their deaths, including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence? Probably. But the whole story gave me chills. So if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult or whatever, or if we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods. I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not gonna specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway, this particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon. Pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and car ready to go, I decided to go out on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 545, which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot and it was getting dark fast so I figured if I moved quick enough I could at least get two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up, with only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast. I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before but definitely not recently. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and I cracked open a can of chill mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike 
in had almost gone away, but it was still there. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees, with the trail at about 30 feet to my left. When you are in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it, and everything on the edge of that circle and past it are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating my dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock, as I was positive that I was the only one on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown the rock not daring to stray too far from my fire, that in hindsight offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night, not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I woke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely unaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling of leaves got harder to hear, as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of the tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I have almost shit my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on, clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night, or attempt a three-mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever or whoever was out here with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light so I decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night there. Eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could hear it. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk too far away, and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then, an hour later, maybe two, it would return, still faint as ever. This went on for about three or four hours until I listened to the steps getting closer and closer until they were about seven feet in front of me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours clutching a knife in my hand and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in and drove and didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy Red Bull, but mostly just to see and or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read what was written in the dust on the back window of my car. Sleep well. A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the weirdest and scariest by far, so I thought I'd share it. 
There are seriously deranged people living in the Superstition Mountains. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. Before I get started, I would like to say this really happened and this is how it went down. No bullshit. This isn't fiction. And I'll warn you, it's long. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous, and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges. No one went to. We fished. We hid from the trains. At night, we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun, we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, Joe and I went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, we worked it out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came. We started out early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well. We had a map, so I gave a what the hell, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the bridge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked the spot to camp. It was a thick, forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days, too. We'd walk around the area a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it, either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and we neared the building we saw. It wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. 
It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Uh, did you hear that? Yeah, man, what the hell is that? It sounds like, uh, people singing. And it did sound like just singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We would still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was a second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you actually believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelit from the way it was flickering. And though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there. But we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer, either. We had about a football field link between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then... It abruptly stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking a different language because we couldn't understand a single word of it. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I had to cover my ears. Then it stopped. At this point I was getting ready to say please let's get the hell out of here when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, They're coming out! We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well. But what we could see was a line of figures walking out the open doorway, all holding hands in a single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move towards us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our shit, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. 
By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there. Got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around. But I heard those voices, and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. When I went to college, I befriended a professor of mathematics. He was one of the most intelligent, eloquent, and articulate people that I've ever known. A remarkable family man who married in his 20s with a daughter and a son. He never drank or smoked and never did do drugs. Never permitted himself to curse, raise his voice, or become aggressive even in disagreements. He was always in control, always punctual and on time, always organized and very disciplined. And he wore clothing that would not look out of place at the turn of the 20th century and acted like a true gentleman. I'm just telling you what kind of man he was. Not a crazy man. Not a junkie. No mental illnesses. I had the pleasure of taking advanced algebra, calculus 1, calculus 2, and differential equations with him. Anyway... We had this STEM club room in the math department where we students hung out to study and chit-chat. And sometimes our professor would join us for help with tutoring, homework, exam study help, and just discussions about various unrelated topics. One time he told us a story about when he saw something strange in the woods. This happened during the 90s when he was a teenager. He lived in Quincy, California during that time and he had a hobby of driving his dad's old beat-up truck all over the Sierra Nevada mountains, just for exploring and also for hunting animals and gathering wild berries. He liked following old mining roads and seeing where they led. One such time, he was out looking for blackberries to pick. It was getting late and the sun had set, so he was driving down the narrow road when he saw there was an obstruction in the road. He saw it looked like someone had stretched a giant plastic bag across the road. He thought it might have been construction work or something. As he drove up to what he thought was a plastic bag stretched across the road, he stopped his vehicle within like 40 feet of it, and he saw that it was not a plastic bag. It was some kind of screen or curtain, a two-dimensional flat shape stretching over the road perpendicular to it. It was a rectangular shape with the width of the road and about 1.5 times in height. And he saw that it was translucent, like some kind of hologram. It was like semi-transparent because when my professor shined a flashlight through the rectangle, the light penetrated through it, illuminating the road past it, but just barely like the light only went a foot or two beyond the screen. It was just standing or floating there, and yet it was not attached to anything. It held its own weight, but it was like weightless at the same time. Its surface was like wavy or rippling. My professor got out of the car to investigate this strange floating rectangle. He went right up to it, and as he did... It was like it was emitting a vibration or low humming that he could feel in his bones. There was an effect that the closer to the rectangle, the stronger the vibration was on the objects around it. And as he got close to it, he saw the hair on his arms standing up, like there was some kind of energy in the air. And there were dense trees on each side of the road, so he couldn't go around this rectangle in the middle of the road. He went up to the trees and broke off a branch. He then poked the branch into this rectangle, and he saw subtle ripples going up and down through the rectangle from the place where he touched the surface. And he stuck the stick all the way into the rectangle, and there was no resistance. But he didn't see the stick going through the other side of the rectangle. It was like it disappeared or became invisible. And then he pulled it out, 
and the stick was unchanged, not burned or deformed. Not knowing what this rectangle was, he went back to his car, continually looking at the rectangle. He didn't want to risk driving through the rectangle, so he drove his car in reverse until the road became wide enough to turn around and head back where he came from. To this day, he doesn't know what it was. He said it looked like a two-dimensional shape, like a semi-transparent rectangle stretched across the road, perpendicular to the surface of the road. He didn't even know how it was possible for a two-dimensional shape to be floating in the air like that, but he saw it with his own two eyes. I don't know if he ever went back there to find out. He didn't elaborate. He didn't even say where exactly this was. This was just when we were chatting in the club room after 6 p.m., doing homework or just resting and eating snacks. And I never got back into contact with him after graduating, moving out of the college town, and then the pandemic hit. I don't know, but I suspect that's one of the things that pushed him to become a professor of mathematics, seeing a rectangle in the middle of the road. That's not something that happens every day, now is it? Anyway, that's all I know. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.